We're good. And you? Yeah, I'm good. I've had some time off this week. Um, good for you. And nice. yes, and headed to watch a baseball game tonight. And there's just nothing more relaxing than going to the ballpark and hollering at the umpire. So <laughs> are you going to the Royals, Riva? No, grand grandson plays. Oh, uh, even better. Yeah. Hi, high school baseball. So excellent. Nice. I've been wanting to get down. I don't know if y'all have seen the new, um, are they called the surge? The new Wichita ballpark looks very nice. That's fun. Well, Megan's boys are very big into baseball. I think she's at the ballpark every night. So we used to back in the day, but I haven't had to do that for a while. Debbie, it looks like it's live streaming, but I'm not finding the record since I paused it. Um, that's odd. Let me, I can do it. I, oh, I got thank it. You. Uh -huh. Debbie, did we have any Kansans open forum comments today? We don't. Yeah. I've had a odd week and um, I'm a little behind on my um, grandchildren's Easter bunny shopping. So I need to get busy with that soon. <laughs> will you be in, will they be coming to you and Lauren Stevie or will you be going to them? Um, actually, we're doing a birthday party for my granddaughter. It's her birthday on Easter. So oh, wonderful. we're doing that in Lawrence. Um, and then I'm going to have an early Easter with my mom and brother tomorrow in uh, north of Topeka. So, wonderful. yeah. And you, uh, you have plans this afternoon. You said you were going to mm -hmm. go do that. So I'm yeah, glad we're having it. several people joining us today on Good Friday. I appreciate it. Yeah, word on the street is that the Easter Bunny will be uh, visiting Corpus Christi after both masses on Sunday. So if you really run out of time, there will be a out in the parking lot somewhere. I don't know if it's a um, somebody in. Uh, you know. Well, it's the Easter Bunny. Mm -hmm. Indeed, yeah, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited. We're, we are taking, we're going to have a quiet Easter work. Night. Well, we're going to take my parents to the Royals game on Sunday. Nice. That's great. Mm -hmm. Hoping for good weather. I'll be right back. Okay. Good morning to everyone that's joining. We will get started here in a few minutes. Good to see you today.
Good morning, Kelly. Um, we've got your slides merged into the PowerPoint, so Amanda can help share those when the time comes. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. I am so glad that you're here. Happy Friday, happy April. Um, today is April 15th, and this is your regularly scheduled early childhood recommendations panel meeting, and I'm so glad to be with all of you this morning. Um, here is our, um, and, and thank you for, for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, today is obviously a remote meeting. That means that we're being live streamed, and I know that we're uh, well, well familiar with this. My name is Amanda Peterson. We'll do our best to remember to identify ourselves before we begin speaking here um, so that folks who are following along on the YouTube live stream can uh, identify who is speaking. Uh, the meeting materials are all available on the Kansas Children's Cabinet website, um, and it, we, we will not be using the chat since that's not something that members of the public can see. Here's today's agenda. We'll, we'll have uh, two parts. So in our big group together, um, we'll, we'll take care of our regular housekeeping business at the beginning. Uh, Debbie will provide us with a, uh, an overview of the application process for the year three of the panel. It's hard to believe, but that begins on July 1st. Um, and she'll also share a, a, a recap and an update from the children's cabinet uh, who received the recommendations that we provided at their April 1st meeting. Uh, we'll turn it over to Kelly Mark from the Kansas Department of Health and Environment to lead a discussion around Provider Appreciation Day. Um, and then we will have our work group breakout session. So we'll go out to our three work groups. Um, we'll take a brief 10 minute break in there and we will come back together at 1030 um, to share back out that information, um, to share, to, to wrap up. Uh, and we should be done today by 11 o'clock. So do I have a motion to approve the agenda for today? This is Gail Kozad. I will move to approve the agenda for today. Thanks, Gail. Do I have a second? This is Amy Meek. Am I uh, second uh, motion? 
Thank you, Amy. All those in favor, please either uh, give me a 3D thumbs up or an emoji thumbs up in the Zoom. Thank you, everybody. Is anybody opposed? Not seeing or hearing any, that passes unanimously. And then do we have any, um, our, our next item is to approve the uh, minutes from March 11th. Um, do we have any updates or edits to those minutes? Would somebody like to move to approve those minutes? This is Natalie McLean. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Thank you, Natalie. Would somebody like to second that? This is Gail Cozad, all second. Thank you, Gail. All those in favor, again, please either uh, a 3D thumbs up or an emoji thumbs up. Thank you, everybody. Is anybody opposed? Terrific. We unanimously approve our March 11th meeting minutes. We didn't have anybody sign up for the Kansans Open Forum today, so I will turn it over to Debbie to talk about the year three panel application process and timeline. Take it away, Debbie. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Um, yes, yeah, so like Amanda said, uh, believe it or not, it's year three of the panel coming up on July 1. And so the application process did begin April 1st, and it is going to be running through May 1st. And so any interested Kansan can apply that is um, interested in possibly serving on the panel, as well as any panel members who are currently serving, you can reapply to uh, continue to serve another term. And so if you are interested in doing that, you uh, need to complete a new application which can be found on the Children's Cabinet website at the link that's provided here. And um, we also ask that any of the current panel members uh, who represent a state agency also reapply just so we can have that on file as we prepare the slate of recommendations to present to the Children's Cabinet. Um, and then uh, to save time, current members do not need to submit a new bio or PIC or resume unless you just want to update the ones that we currently have on file. So all of your applications will be reviewed and then a slate of candidates, as I mentioned, will be recommended for consideration and approval by the Children's Cabinet at their June 3rd meeting. And so then the approved applicants will be immediately notified and their terms will begin on July 1 to run through June 30th of 2023. So as you all know, we currently have 40 panel members, which was the same number that we had um, in year one. And that seems to be a manageable number. So we anticipate that that will look similar to what we will plan to move forward with into year three, but that will be determined as the process continues and that applications are reviewed. Uh, we do need to have a representation from all of the groups that are identified in the executive order. And these are listed on the application and you can check the box that applies to you when you are applying. Um, but um, as most of you are familiar with, it does include state agencies of DCF, had, um, DCF, KSDE, and KDHE, sorry, and then Head Start representatives, providers, and organizations providing early childhood services to Kansas children and families, uh, Kansas family members with children who are receiving services, and uh, also representatives from local school districts and higher ed education institutions. And then the other category with various individuals who serve in some capacity as early childhood stakeholders throughout the state. So you are more than welcome to contact me if you have any questions. Um, and then also you will see on the application if you haven't already filled it out that it will be submitted to me and then I will take it from there. So one question that was asked at the uh, early childhood stakeholders group meeting a couple of weeks ago and that I wanted to touch on, uh, someone asked is, are the meetings going, going to continue to be virtual? Because I know that that might determine uh, some people's interest in participating or ability to participate. That question is not on the application, but in hindsight, what I am planning on doing is uh, reaching out to everyone who applies and just asking them what your preferences for that. So that going into the, the year three, we kind of have a, a good picture of what 
everyone wants to do with that in what your availability is. So that will be uh, happening. So if, um, if anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer them. I have gotten several applications. So if you haven't done so and you're interested, please go ahead and, and get that done in the next couple of weeks. And then uh, the process will continue. Thanks, Debbie. Do we have any questions or, or discussion for Debbie or for the group? All right, then we will uh, move to this next piece. Okay. Well, I, I know that I was able to share with you in an email uh, shortly after this happened, but I want to recap again that the uh, good news is that the two recommendations from all of you that were presented to the Children's Cabinet on April 1st uh, were approved. And so there were a few questions asked uh, for clarity and some discussion, and then everything was approved as, approved as presented. Um, so there were no changes made to the two recommendations that you brought forward. And recognition of the process that took place um, and the hard work from all of you as panel members and then also the non-panel members that join in on our work groups every month as content advisors was acknowledged by everyone and appreciation was definitely expressed for all of these accomplishments um, that have been taking place over the last several months and we um, as we've discussed during the process of de developing these recommendations uh, this is the intent of the panel's role, to identify a need from within the early childhood system and to elevate that need in this case as a recommendation to the Children's Cabinet. And um, we also want to continue uh, to mention and recognize, for example, the work that the Family Partnerships Group did to identify the need to collaborate within the system, uh, with this, in this case with the Family Leadership Team to continue the development of a possible shared definition for family engagement. So again, as I mentioned before, this um, work can look different. Um, in the form of a recommendation or possibly collaboration. And so this is the governance structure in action. Um, and Melissa also shared with the cabinet members that the work groups are continuing. And if more recommendations are developed at any point in the future, the cabinet members should expect those to be brought forward at that time for um, the same process, their consideration and approval. And there's no specific timeline for that to happen. So it's only if and when the time is right that that recommendation might be brought forward. So um, I can't say enough uh, what good work it is and how excited it was to be a part of that. And it was very well received and appreciated by the cabinet members. And so congratulations to all of you for, for the work that was done and um, all of the good work that I know is going to continue. And folks, I'd love to echo that. And this is Amanda Peterson. It's a little cheesy, but I'd love for you. There's a few things that make me happier than a Zoom virtual round of applause. And I'd love for you to all like take a beat here to celebrate. Yes, thank you, Reva. That this was really, you know, it is hard work to take a, a, a strategic plan and something as complicated as our Kansas early childhood system and be able to have the voice of stakeholders continue to um, say, you know, here's here's how we think we should continue to move forward. I appreciate that it is um, hard work and that a lot of work went into developing those recommendations. I want you to rest assured that that sparked some really terrific conversation, and I'm sure that that will continue to uh, inform great work. So really, thank you to all of you for, for taking the time to pull um, those recommendations recommendations together and to think hard about them and to share them on because that's um, really important as we continue to uh, move our work forward. We've said a lot of times that our strategic plan, we don't want it to be something that just sits on a shelf and gathers dust somewhere in Topeka. Um, and it really is, um, I very much appreciate all of all of you and the, the work that you continue to do to keep moving that forward. Do we have any? I mean, um, oh, go ahead, Debbie. I'm going to jump in real quick because when you mentioned the strategic plan, one of the comments from uh, the cabinet members was that they were very appreciative that we were able to connect and, and you know, bring attention to the connection between the recommendations it's themselves and the strategic plan. And we're appreciative that that is something that was intentional and that we were mindful of during that process. 
So everybody, um, we on our team, I, I uh, keep this uh, keep this handy and refer to it often, but we were uh, recently doing a little spring cleaning and found extra copies. And I know that there are extra copies in the children's cabinet uh, office as well. If anybody has uh, misplaced, given away, loaned out their copy and would like a hard copy, or if anybody who's listening would like a hard copy of the All In for Kansas Kids Strategic Plan, um, probably the easiest would be to email Debbie at ddeer at ksde.org. And thanks in advance, Debbie, for gathering those. Um, but we're always more than happy to, to share those out. We've got a lot of great work that went into these, and we, we like to make sure that they're in the hands of people who can use them. So with that, do we have any questions or discussion on this? All right, then Kelly, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Amanda. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kelly Mark. I'm the director of the Bureau of Family Health at KDHE. And I want to take a few minutes today to talk to you about Child Care Provider Appreciation Day. So uh, this was started in 1996 by a group of volunteers in New Jersey. Child Care Provider Appreciation Day is celebrated the Friday before Mother's Day every year to recognize child care providers, teachers, and other educators of young children everywhere. Next slide, Amanda. Great. So this year, KDHE is celebrating Child Care Provider Appreciation Day in several different ways, and we would like to invite you to join us. So we have submitted an application for a governor's proclamation to mark May 6th, um, 2022 as Child Care Appreciation Day. We're also planning a media release um, as well as a social media campaign. We're going to be using the hashtag Thank You Child Care. KDHE is partnering with Child Care Aware of America. They do a really robust campaign every year for Provider Appreciation Day. Um, and you can go to the site providerappreciation.org to read all about Child Care Aware of America's um, opportunities they have and activities. You can download tools you can use in your community to celebrate. So um, let's talk about how you can join us um, and we can have discussion afterwards as well as questions, but be on the lookout for our media release and our social media messages. You can share those far and wide. Um, please use the hashtag thank you child care on your own social media posts that you do at the local level. Um, and Child Care Aware of America on the providerappreciation.org site has this really cool, super easy video link. And you can use that to record videos of yourself or your staff or your family showing appreciation for child care providers in, you, in your community or an individual child care provider or facility that's important to your family. And you can post those videos on social media. Um, if you're not the video type, they also have a link for testimonials. So you can go out, you can write your own um, testimonial on there that you can post on, so, on social media. And they've got a really cool um, self-care is important, a self-care challenge for child care providers that you can download at that site too. Um, and if you're going to be celebrating Child Care Provider Appreciation Day in your organization or your community, please let us know. We would love to share your posts um, as well as do a write-up of all the ways folks celebrated in Kansas to post on our website um, after the day has passed. Next slide, Amanda. That's really all um, I had for you today, but I'd love to have some discussion um, around what you all are going to do for Child Care Provider Appreciation Day, how you can partner with us, and answer any questions that you have. I'm going to move you all back to my big window. Um, Kelly, I'm going to jump on really quick. This is Debbie, and I just want to say thank you to all of the child care providers that are part of the panel because it's so important to have you join us every month and to elevate your voices. And that's definitely the purpose of, of having you here with us. So um, it's a perfect time of the year to be able to say thank you for everything that you do. Most definitely. This is Tanya Bullock. Um, Kelly, uh, I wasn't aware of the governor's proclamation. Is it going to be a problem that I submitted one for our local providers in our community? I, you know, I don't, I would guess they might combine them together, but I'm not sure if they will or not. I have not heard back on our application yet. 
Um, I don't know if you've heard back on yours, but I don't think it'll be a problem. Okay. If I, I get, if I get word, I'll let you know. And if you do let me know and we, we did, we did, I'll be receiving okay. it on. Yeah. May 3rd uh, is when we'll be receiving it just in time for May 6th is um, so I, I guess I'll share that day with you. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't I, I, heard anything back on our application. Okay. So. We're, we're going to, the, the city hall is going to present it and we're going to have a few providers and families standing behind us when the Great. mayor. Uh, so awesome. we'll, we love pictures. We love okay. post those pictures. Okay. We we're happy to share. We're actually, they said we can invite as many as we wanted. So we're going to Awesome. Child care licensing is going to help me um, spread the word and get invites out. Fantastic. Uh, this is Reva Waiwatis. Um, in Topeka, we're going to have a provider appreciation event um, in conjunction with our local AYC group the evening of May 2nd. And plans are still underway, but we're thinking it's going to be a parking lot party where people can just come and go from the parking lot. And we'll have fun and festivities of some shape. I'm not exactly sure yet, but stay tuned. Um, and then the child care task force in Manhattan that is um, being uh, coordinated by the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce is planning a provider appreciation event on Sunday, May the 1st from 3 to 5 p.m. Um, it will be at um, Meadowlark, I think it's called Meadowlark Hills. It's a local retirement community. And the, the bigger picture plan is some kind of a volunteer coordination that might come um, trying to recruit uh, retirees and seniors to um, get involved as volunteers in child care programs. So they agreed to um, host this event and they have an online submission form where um, employers or families or community members can um, submit a provider's name and just say why they think they're awesome. And um, then they'll do some kind of media around that. So awesome. This is Emily Barnes and for CCPC, we're not hosting a specific provider appreciation event, but every year we do make sure um, that membership receives <coughs> um, a, a token of appreciation and, and a note and everything. So we're, we're working on um, those details um, at that time and it will be sent out in the month of May. And then we do have um, our upcoming conference that starts on the 23rd. And at that point, we will also recognize um, this provider's efforts um, that have been put forth. So not a specific provider appreciation event, but we will be showing our appreciation to the, the workforce. All right, so Kelly, um, if you might be able to share like a brief recap that we could cut and paste and forward on to our communications folks to Debbie so that she could share that out um, in the panel recap. I think we can all add a to do of making sure that whoever in our organization runs social media knows that um, that there'll be that, that this is coming up. I think that would be really terrific. And then Kelly, is there but besides checking that out and thinking about making videos or anything else, is that am I right? That's our our follow up. Yep. Terrific. Well, so we so would much love pictures from or pictures or, you know, write ups of anything that happens um, around the state. We want to do kind of a recap and, and post on the KDHE website about here's how the state of Kansas celebrated Child Care Prov Provider Appreciation Day. So feel free to send me your stuff. It's all so exciting. I love that. Terrific. 
All right, everybody, thank you for sharing some upcoming plans and we'll look forward to celebrating together. Reba, I've definitely got the evening of May 2nd now on my calendar, so that sounds like a whole lot of fun. Um, so, for, so now we're going to uh, break out and we're just a little bit early, but I think that all, I'm looking around, I think that all of our facilitators are here, so we should be in good shape. Um, we will head to our assigned work groups. Uh, if you've got any questions or need any help, don't, or if you feel really welcome to highlight that for me and Debbie, and we can make sure that you get to the right place. But we will come back together at uh, 1030 here in the big room. Have a great conversation, everybody. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Hello, Quality and Environments Work Group. Hope everybody's doing well today. It's good to see all of you. And uh, before we get started, I just want to give another shout out to all of you for the recommendation that got passed. So it uh, went through with flying colors. I also meant to, and I didn't mention it in the full group, but we are, I am planning on presenting that to the state ICC this afternoon. So I will be doing that at, um, their meeting starts at 1.30 and um, give, it, give it to them in its entirety. I mean, I've been keeping them updated a little bit along the way, uh, so they're expecting it, but you know, I'll be able to go over it in great detail. And then of course, um, Dave will be there to help answer any further questions that anyone might have. And uh, then hopefully if approved, they will start uh, putting together some kind of a formal implementation plan to make that happen. So I will keep everybody updated on that as that happens. So. Um, what I was thinking is that I will give a brief recap of what we talked about in March. I did send out those notes to all of you, and um, some of you might have had a chance to look over them. There was some really good conversation. And then um, we can pull up the Jamboard and I guess kind of talk through what, what it looks like. And then Lucas, I will let you... Uh, lead the conversation if you if you want to and my thought for today was to uh, maybe start trying to narrow down maybe top three priority focus areas that everybody wanted to think about or you know I don't know if three is the right number we can decide that and then if there's any research that needs to be done or if um, if anyone thinks that we need to maybe schedule some guest speakers to come to next month and uh, present some information that you might want to hear, then we can uh, definitely do that or um, any additional links and documents, of course, that, you know, come up as we reference those that um, I can help share out. So to start, and then we're going to take a break at 10. So I'm really going to try to keep track of the time and, and let everybody have their break at 10 o'clock. Um, to recap what happened in March, uh, you know, kind of started our phase two, as we called it, um, to, to start talking about what are some new ideas. And I know one of the big things that was a takeaway was just uh, the, the focus on hearing the provider voice and making sure that we continue to put priority on that um, as a work group and then just throughout the um, early childhood system opportunities that uh, can be made available. And I know that some of those examples that were talked about were the childcare systems improvement team. And I also put these on the Jamboard um, 
is doing a quarterly evening meeting. Um, we just did a quarter, uh, not a quarterly, but a bi-weekly webinar uh, in the evening last week with CCPC. Emily was the uh, rock star of that and presented really great information. And uh, we were thrilled to be able to do that. We also have another evening event scheduled in May uh, so that hopefully some providers can join us there. And then, um, I'm drawing a blank, but I know there was one other one that um, I think is on the jam board. So just being intentional about, you know, elevating provider voices and trying to uh, provide opportunities for them to participate. Um, and then there was some conversation around legislation and um, ideas with that and, you know, talked about lobbying versus educating um, and how that might look. And some there was some interest there. Uh, there was, uh, and I shared this out with you, Jennifer was able to share a workforce development advisory group survey that was done, that was talked about. And so I shared that link for everybody um, to look at as well as the childcare mapping experience that was uh, relevant to some of the conversations last month. And, um, and then there was also a question mentioned about our providers getting the training and support they need to do their job. Um, so professional development, especially again, going back to addressing children with special health care needs, um, and that could also potentially increase capacity. So that's what I had notes about. Um, if anybody else has anything extra to share, please do so. I don't know if anybody has any other thoughts on any of that or if I missed something. Debbie, the only thing that I would um, add for consideration um, in, within quality and environments, something that I think everybody knows I'm passionate about is making sure that, that we're making the infrastructure investments that we need to make. And that is, uh, you know, I think everybody knows that um, we are wrapping up a, about a $3.5 million project um, to serve. At, as we go through licensing, I think we'll be serving about 100 kids in Lindsborg or be able to serve hundred kids in Lindsborg. Um, and I, I know that's not what uh, is right for every family um, uh, and that uh, home providers are, are a very important part of the uh, childcare ecosystem. But um, I think a lot of families uh, and communities uh, would benefit from the kind of project that we're doing in Lindsborg, from the kind of project that uh, Hilltop is looking at doing in, in Lawrence as they expand. And, and I, um, I don't know that I have, have a, a, uh, a clear idea of what that recommendation would look like, but um, I, I wonder if there isn't, uh, if that's not something that we want to, to bring up um, as, we, as we think through things of, because that kind of thing doesn't happen without help from somewhere. Uh, our project was possible because we have a, um, you know, somebody who who has been exceptionally successful in business, who who made a, a 1.5 million dollar pledge. Um, but for other communities to be able to have that kind of a, a improvement in in the quality uh, quality of their environments for a childcare center, we're going to need the state, uh, I think, to step up. So. <laughs> And Emily, I see your hand. So real quick before that, um, you know, and the other thing too is the mention of how does this connect to the strategic plan and what would this address? Um, it would definitely address the issue of capacity. You know, so that would that would be hands down um, in addition to others, I'm sure. So I wanted to throw that in there. Emily? Um, so actually, I really appreciate what you're saying, Lucas. And one of the things that it sparked for me when you made the comment about, you know, I know that home providers are important. Yes, we are. However, I, I think part of the conversation needs to be that we need to get real honest about what mixed delivery means. And if we're really, truly serious about creating efficient, sustainable, mixed delivery, we have to get real honest about the fact that all forms of childcare rely and depend upon each other. I need high quality centers to 
exist in my area. And it's the same thing for role A for accessibility, but also B, not everybody does great in a home child care as well. I've had children that I needed to make the recommendation of it would be best to put them in a center that focused on XYZ educational focus, you know, whatever it is that that child was needing at that time. So I think part of it also is getting real honest on what the word mixed means. It, it means a collaboration and a support of each other um, that, you know, the different environments understand what we all offer and how we work together and how we support the other environments as well. And so I, I think that that's really important. Um, to that end, I think one of the things that also needs, if we're going to truly talk about infrastructure, we need to talk about sustainable funding because one of the things specifically that family child care providers are facing is by accepting this third round of sustainability grants. Um, some people are starting to get questions from their clients about why prices are going up, um, that if we're receiving this grant money, then, you know, why should we be allowed to increase our rates? That's a very unfair question. <laughs> um, and so, so I think you're right that we do need to talk about infrastructure and we need to talk about facilities and how and sustainability specifically the sustainability of how we create these paradigms that help providers go forward regardless of which environment they're in because we're going to collaborate and support each other at at the risk of becoming an echo chamber between you and me emily yeah it this the covid covid money coming from child care where it's great and how to explain to families that it is one time money I, I don't, I, it's, it's a struggle, isn't it? Uh, it's one-time money. We can't, we can't stop making the improvements and, and stop changing how we value our, our work and our employees just because we're going to get money for six months. And, and it's a, it's a really difficult conversation. And when people refuse to enter into the conversation about how we legitimately make this go forward, it cannot be maintained. The, the work that providers have done at the financial level that we have been doing it at cannot be maintained when people are unwilling to enter into that conversation of how do we sustain this? Jennifer, did you have comments? I just have, sorry, I'm gonna lower my hand just to make sure that it's not like looking like I'm constantly wanting to ask a question. But um, so I think um, both Lucas and Emily have really valid points about the sustainability and the capacity, um, you know, the, the needed capacity to help support um, families uh, throughout the state. And, um, I, I would add, and, and this may be, I guess, assumed in what Lucas and Emily had uh, been talking about around capacity, but um, nonetheless, I, I just kind of want to put it out there that I think that in addition to talking about like physical capacity to be able to serve more children, that we also have to talk about the ability to be able to um, build workforce, to be able to provide that capacity, because without a qualified workforce, um, I mean, you could have as much capacity as you, as you, as you can build, but um, without the people to be able to provide the services, it, um, it, it does not, um, it can't be successful. And so I think those two pieces go hand in hand. And I think that that again, goes back to a lot of the things that we've been talking about. And certainly sustainability of that is, is in, in increasing, you know, extremely important as well. And, and part of that sustainability is, you know, how do you recruit people? How do you retain people? How do you think about wages and pay equity in comparison to, you know, other um, other opportunities for for people who are coming into the field and um, and so you know I think that there's I mean obviously this is a, a really big <laughs> systemic uh, issue and um, but I, I think that you um, you know from my perspective you have to talk about those two things in conjunction with one another I, I agree wholeheartedly but also 
isn't there a, a, a separate work group that is focused on that question? Perhaps. <laughs> I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm sure that there, that's probably true. Yeah, with, within the panel, the child care recruitment and retention. So what we could do is um, just when they report out today, you know, see where they're at and then see if there's any opportunities for us to, um, you know, overlap with what they're doing and, and how that might look um, as it ties into what, what you're wanting to focus on. Right. And I think that that from in thinking about that, that's uh, a really uh, important, I think, thing to consider is how do you how do you work together with that other group then? I, I will. I'll also say that that's part of why we did a, a three point five million dollar building project was to underscore the dignity of the work that folks are doing. They deserve to work in a, in a pleasant environment. Um, they deserve to, to work in a, in a place that validates the work that they're doing and that, that helps to meet their needs uh, during their, their work day. So. Jenny. Hi, yes, I wanted to share a little bit about um, something that might be helpful to tag team on, or at least get an update from that other work group on in May. Um, I don't know if if anyone's heard of um, the true cost of care cost models or calculators and Simon Workman, um, but he's going to come talk. Um, I'm arranging for him to come talk with the um, workforce or the recruitment and retention work group um, about how we can use some models we're developing to um, take some different scenarios of what it would mean to um, compensate workforce more and plug those in and then see what the overall cost would be to a community or to, um, let's say, the state overall, and then have, be able to have discussions about how we fund that. Uh, you know, it's a, a big and sometimes scary conversation. But it, in terms of the workforce, I just wanted to put in a plug for that. Um, and so that at least we, I love the idea of going back and forth because yes, I agree. I think we, the building, the infrastructure and this capital investments, the soft, you know, having staff is important. Um, so I'll try to see if I can get an update on that um, too. And then um, when Lucas, when you were talking about your community, I, and <laughs> amazing, I know there's some amazing stories across the state. And I do wonder if anybody's documenting what the struggles that it takes to reach that what are the elements, what are the ingredients that help um, a community get to this point where you have different people investing in a great vision like that? Um, what's working? What are the struggles that are out there? How might other communities um, maybe learn from what Lindsborg is doing? I, I, I imagine there's people, I'm really into storytelling and kind of collecting stories and best practices and sharing that around. And I wonder if maybe someone at least in your community is kind of keeping track of what's working, what's not working, how did you get to this point? Who are the players at the table? Just that more of a question, a thought, anybody's collecting that information, telling the story. I, um, you know, we, we are trying to tell us, we're trying to tell a particular story right now to, to, to finish out fundraising and whether or not, um, you know, whether or not there will be kind of a post-mortem, uh, I, I don't know. Um, it, uh, you know, how, it, what we've done in Lindsborg has um, kind of centered around, um, I, I think there are a, lo a lot of communities like Lindsborg uh, in Kansas, but, um, you know, we are between Salina and McPherson, lots of good jobs, not enough people. And so what we are doing is about building the future of our region. Um, and it is driven in part because of my experience uh, in, with my daughter's childcare at Hilltop in Lawrence. And so having, having a really clear picture of, of what we wanted to replicate, and then um, you know, the, having a, the city be willing to invest my time in that. So it, it's, an, it's been an interesting journey um, and, and would love to have opportunities to 
to talk about that uh, and to share that story. But um, yeah. So Jenny, back to your question as far as our people um, gathering some of that, I would say that's part of the um, consumer education r, &R contract through DCF or through the CCDF funding. Um, there is an element in there around community engagement. And so, and childcare where it has that contract right now. And I think they're getting themselves more and more situated within the different communities and learning a little bit more of some of those different efforts um, and how they can help. So kind of pulling together some of those different ideas of what's worked over here and what's worked over there and being able to do some different types of needs assessments and things like that within the communities in partnership with the communities so that they can learn a little bit more. And more importantly, the different communities can learn from each other. Um, so I, I giving a little shout out. Um, I think that I see that as part of the work that child care where is doing within their community engagement piece. Um, I, I want to kind of piggyback a little bit on what Lucas had talked about in Lindsborg and what we're trying to do. Um, kind of gotten out of the, we're talking about sharing the story and getting people invested. We've kind of tried to get away as we're taking, we're trying to expand in our project or on our business a little bit here. We're going to have 450 kids in the next year and a half uh, over two facilities, but it's not meant, I mean, everyone knows we have a lot of kids, but the pulling at the hard strings and we all need more money. I think we all know that people don't, people haven't responded to that. And that's not to say that people are against us making more money, but no, it's like, cool, that's great, but I don't want to pay more. So we've really tried to do what Lindsborg has done, and we're trying to come out from an economic development standpoint. We want the city to understand without us in the last two years has highlighted that the economic impact of childcare being not available, what that means. And we're, we're working with KU Endowment. Uh, they have a new giant project coming up and they know they need, it's a business and it's a uh, government contracts expansion and they needed childcare. Um, so we're trying to leverage that business development that they have going in and saying, well, if you want child care, here's what we have. We're a quality program. So th that's what that's the that's what we're trying to get invested here. And it's no I can sit in all kinds of committee meetings, people who are in child care. We all know we're all going to say the same things over and over again. But we had to get people at the table who don't know anything about child care, but understand the impact of what it means if you don't have it. Um, and so that's kind of the people we've tried to get at the table are more and more business people. I, I was, I would say the, the old, the old money here in town, we need to get to the table and say, this impacts your wallet if you don't expand on what this community can do. So, and it's not, it's not just some sort of childcare. It's, it's quality childcare. The story that, right. that I tell is one of the really large employers in Salina uh, as we were starting three years ago said, yeah, this is important because we're trying to recruit engineers and we'll fly them in for an interview and they will say, hey, this job's great. You guys are doing innovative work. This is what I went to school to do. I'm not moving my family to central Kansas because you don't have uh, child care that I would send my kids to. We had spots. We didn't have a, attractive, high quality child care. And, and that is, is and, and, and so being able to tell that story well uh, I think you know, obviously Hilltop's very well positioned to to tell that story, um, but helping more programs to and and I think a lot of communities, if it's just about the perceived need in that community, folks are quite happy to say, well, we'll we'll find an old building and we'll put some tables in it and call it good. And that is not that is not the work that grows uh, Kansans. I'm going to kind of jump on some of that too, because um, so like, uh, I think what it also kind of comes into Jenny, what you were talking about as far as, you know, the, the cost of operation conversation, like that has to start happening. And um, even among the workforce, like people don't truly don't know how to advocate for themselves because I think in many, like, I'm actually very interested in that meeting that you were talking about because I've, 
heard many times that we need to enter into the conversation. I've heard many times that there is information that could help us with that discussion, but I've never actually sat in on it. And so I don't even have the verbiage on how do we go forward with some of these concepts on how do we get the business people to the table so that we can discuss. You might be approaching retirement age, but however, if you are about to retire and the other employees in your multi-million dollar company don't actually have high quality childcare, what does that mean for the efficiency in your business? And how can you as a, a, a more experienced person in the field help with attending to this need that doesn't apply directly to your life, but here's the cost of what happens when your employees don't have quality care or they have care that is dangerous, you know, things like that. Um, so, so I think that's one of the keys is getting, getting to the people who don't necessarily want to engage in it, but they have, they have an indirect stake that is very valuable and getting that verbiage on how do we get this conversation out there? Because a lot of people just see a political line and they shut right down and will not engage in it. And we have to break through that. This is really helpful. I think um, it, it sounds like everybody who spoke in response has a piece of, it has an ingredient to the solution, right? Um, I, I, um, I'll think, I'll get some more bullet points on what that conversation will look like. Or Debbie, you, you probably um, are aware and I'll connect with you and just see if it is actually meeting some of the needs. I wonder if there's, you couldn't have them come here or couldn't tag team. Um, but I think that the, uh, it sounds like, um, Megan, from what you're saying, that um, there will be someone who's kind of taking, I think my, my, one of my interests when I worked in special education at the time is called that department at KU, um, they, um, one of the projects we worked on, there were models of best practice where in communities things were working and it was basically one pagers that kind of went down, this is what this community did to do X. That's kind of the thing I envision. It sounds like um, childcare where it, through some of these, um, the work that DCF is um, funding will be will be a housing place for that information. Will be the carrying that forward and already is in many ways. I think so. Just someone who's collecting like the stories to then help tell like okay, bring economic, bring commerce to the table. This is what we did. Um, we made the business case. Sounds like it would be a really valuable tool for uh, to contribute to those discussions of like, bringing down more funding um, overall or different payers. So. Anyway, I, thank you everybody. I appreciate that. And it's also very inspiring to hear. I know it's been long, a long journey for some communities to get to where you are, so. And it, it you know, something you said sparked for me. I, it, not that these events are always at times that are convenient to attend, but it's about going to things like Chamber of Commerce uh, gala events or whatever. And when there's a question and answer period saying, what are we doing on childcare? Mm -hmm. I hounded the Secretary of Commerce, David Toland, for two years, anytime I was in a question and answer period with him, I said, what are we doing on childcare? Um, and, and it has, I think, helped to change the conversation at Commerce about the importance of childcare. I mean, it helps that David Toland's wife is a professor in early childhood at Allen County Community mm -hmm. College, right? But uh, so he was very happy to have that question asked but pr providing people an opportunity to talk in, in rooms that are not dedicated to childcare, I think is really important. Maritis. Um, yes, uh, to follow up with Lucas, I, I think it's, I'm not sure how, if childcare providers are active in the, or members of the Chamber of Commerce. And so if, if our providers are in or are attending some chamber of commerce event or just involved in some capacity or just be members, then it's also it would also help in connecting with the business community and you know expressing our needs and how we can support them and how they can support us. Hey, Maritas, I'm going to hop in on that. Um, 
I think the people who know that the providers who know about community or a uh, chamber of commerce, they know that they should. Um, but it becomes yet another bullet point of things on the to-do list that you, you just you don't have the brain space to get it all done in a day or a week or a month. And especially when we enter into the conversation about the chamber of commerce meetings are not always going to happen in the evening and, and they're not even going to be willing to commit to making it at times that providers can get there. Many providers are just going to shut down. Yeah. And so I saw the the sticky note come up about, you know, like community education. Some of it is that we need to get the community education out there of why, like, I know that I need to join my community or my chamber of commerce, but I haven't because it is yet another bullet point that I've got to do. And I'm already, if you look at the number of boards I'm already on, like I, I can't add another board meeting. Um, and, and so so, so that is one of the dynamics going on there. I don't think it's that they don't want their voice. Some of it, they don't know that their voice belongs there. And the other part is if they do know their voice belongs there, it is just another thing to put in their basket to get done in a day. I, I do appreciate that feedback, uh, Emily. Um, I, I serve at the Chamber of Commerce here in my community. And I can say that not a lot of members attend the meeting. You know, there are several committees and not, not, not everybody. Um, so I, th this conversation, actually, I haven't really thought about that until I hear about this conversation. So I just emailed them and say, and said, do we have members or chamber of commerce, you know, but maybe even if, if I still say that even if a provider is just a member, just for them knowing that we have providers on our on the chamber then the people that are working there can think of sometimes they think about the small business what do we do for a small business um it's it's just a thought i have not connected that and i do really appreciate i i understand how schedules can conflict with so many things especially especially for you <laughs> and then the other people. Well, and for and it's, it's a hugely important thought. And so like having your brain like wrapped around that, like it, it's hugely important. And I, I will say, you know, a lot of it, it's like I've spent basically three years now just over and over and over again, trying to help providers see their own intrinsic value um, that, that they deserve to be supported and they, they deserve for their voice to be out there, but they're also learning how to, to do that because it's, it's very intimidating when, when all you do is white butts all day, it's very hard, you know, cause that that's oftentimes how providers, how childcare in general has been approached up until the, um, pandemic, the pandemic is what kind of lifted the veil in many ways. But up until that, we we were just the help that wiped the butts and we just had to keep the kids alive is, you know, it, and but that was not even close to reflective of what we were doing. And so some of it is helping the workforce learn you are intrinsically valuable to our society. And without you, America does not work, literally does not work without us. And, um, and so, and because I've had conversations where I referred to a person in the conversation as my colleague and I saw their shoulders roll backwards and all of a sudden they stood a little taller. It's things like that. And so, so some of the community awareness is it, not just telling the established business people, hey, by the way, these people are important. It's also helping them, you know, the messaging needs to be like, you are intrinsically valuable to us and you are strong and you did this. And I, like, I've started to say, you know, like people have mistakenly said that providers, you know, stepped up to the plate in the pandemic. We didn't, we never stepped up to anything. We were already there. Part of why Kansas made it through the pandemic the way we did is because of the workforce that was already there, already doing the work. And so that has to be acknowledged if we're going to truly have quality in our environment, it has to be acknowledged and helping providers realize that about themselves. I, let's, let's merit this. I really appreciate that, Emily. 
I'm, I'm making notes also on how I can do my job in support of what we are working here in the community that I work. The other issue I think also is membership because it costs it cost a lot to be a member. I'm going to piggyback on the Chamber of Commerce um, situation. For me personally, when I was running my child care facility for years, I didn't participate in the Chamber for a long time because of the very reasons that Emily's talking about. You know, there just, it wasn't even a thought that crossed my mind that I had time to do. Uh, eventually, when um, my situation changed a little and I was more admin than I was, you know, um, in the classroom every day. It gave me the opportunity to go start doing that. And it really opened a whole new world for uh, me to be able to um, network and to get more um, awareness out there among the members. But then I was also given a couple of opportunities to present um, information and be able to share that out, you know, with the members and it, you know, and Increased enrollment, which was great, but it also helped me educate. And so if those opportunities are available, I think they're well worth it. But it's also an expense to belong to the chamber. And, you know, not all child care providers can afford that, you know, in the big picture of what they're trying to pay for every day, especially now with increased food costs and everything else that's happening. So um, those are all um, things to be aware of and just kind of my personal experience with it, but it was, it was a good experience, but there were a lot of days where I had intentions of going to the meeting and I had to stop and cook lunch instead. And because my cook was sick. And so I was like, well, I really wanted to come today. We, you know, but I couldn't, and that, you know, it was very hit and miss. Um, I'm, I'm going to throw a little wrench in here, like Lucas says sometimes, <laughs> and, you know, we're focusing on the child care um, centers a lot, but one of the sticky notes that I added here that was a conversation that we had way back in the beginning of this work group, and they're the orange ones, and this applies more to the um, home child care providers, and being able to increase possibly increase capacity for that, it's, um, and it is part of the strategic plan goal seven, under quality and environments about the HOA regulations that a lot of communities have across the state that uh, potentially serve as barriers for child care, home child care providers to be able to even consider opening a facility in their home. And so, you know, that might be something too um, for us to revisit if anyone's interested. I know that um, I don't believe anybody has tackled that anywhere. I think it would be chartering new territory. Um, but I know personally, again, um, as a provider that started in my home, it was very difficult to uh, approach this. It wasn't so much from an HOA standpoint at that time, it was more local zoning regulations that were really big barriers for me. But um, that's another food for thought that we might want to consider. Um, does anyone have any other comments about any of this? At some point in our group, I would like us to talk about like the child care mapping stuff. Um, the HOA thing, it, it's real. I've known of people that were no longer able to continue because their HOAs got out of control. Um, I intend when I bought my house, I intentionally avoided any neighborhood with an HOA because I just didn't want to have to deal with the potential of that issue. Because um, I mean, it, it can it can even get so specific on the city itself might have a regulation on what that, that you have to have a fence around that if you're going to operate a, a family based, you know, a family child care in your home, you have to, in order to meet city code, have to have a fence around your yard. And then the HOA is going to tell you which fence. And if you have to have a wrought iron fence, you're looking at an astronomical cost in order to meet the HOA regulation. And basically HOAs our law, you, you cannot break it. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, it, it is definitely worth um, the conversation. I don't know that I'm exactly the one to engage with it because I avoided HOAs at all costs for a lot of reasons. Um, but yeah, people have fought against their HOAs and had people, you know, reporting, you know, neighbors reporting them for false stuff just because they didn't like the fact that there was a daycare in the neighborhood. Um, so, it's a thing and it needs to be tackled. But I would like us at some point today to talk about the child care mapping um, results because I had some thoughts on that whenever it's appropriate. Sheila? 
Hi, hello, good morning. Um, one of the things I was thinking about as we talk about increasing capacity is also creating a platform for parents to identify their need for childcare. Um, because I've had countless um, conversations with parents who don't qualify for our child care due to a uh, lack of criteria because we're um, grant based on at risk and or head start. And um, we used to have KPP spots, but next year those are going away. Um, and so um, I don't know, I think that that would be something of benefit to identify how many Kansans need quality child care. I am going to jump in. Uh, Lucas, do you want to make your comments? And then it is 10 o'clock. So I want to be able to give us a break. So maybe you can um, make your comments and then we'll take a break for 10 minutes and come back. Sure. I And I was just going to comment on the HOA. I, I, I don't know quite how to have that conversation because we're with the zoning. I think I, I you know, as a, as a city, uh, city administration professional, I understand how we would approach that. On the HOA side, it's not accidental that HOA rules make it difficult to run a childcare facility. It's on purpose. HOAs don't want people running businesses in 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 their uh, neighborhoods, and so I'm I'm not really sure um, how to approach that, and um, or if it if it makes sense to just really focus on on city zoning and and helping uh, cities to, to see opportunities to expand capacity. Debbie, can I just say one thing real quick? I promise. Um, to Sheila, I really appreciated your comment about finding out a little bit more about family needs and preferences. And that is one thing actually um, within the relief portfolio is to do uh, contract out to do a family needs and preference study. Um, and to really give us, it'll include families as well as child care providers to really give us some more, well, our goals for it is to really give us a more in-depth understanding of exactly what you're talking about, Sheila, what are those needs, but then also a different types of assistance, obviously child care assistance or subsidy also playing a role in that, you know, why, what are some of the barriers in um, participation and things like that so we can try and um, address any of those barriers as well. So just more of an update and information. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it is 10.03. Let's take a 10-minute break. We'll come back at 10.13 and continue the conversation until 10.30. Thank you.
Hey, Debbie, what time are we supposed to be back? Um, now? 10, thir 10, 13, yeah, for now. <laughs> I, I need to step up for like probably five minutes to go, to, I'll be back. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> So it's 1013 and I see some faces are back. There's a, still a few missing. I'll give it another minute or so. What I, what I was doing uh, during the break is I did look up the strategic plan and I put some sticky notes in there for um, the conversation around um, infrastructure and increasing capacity and business community. So that is goal four of the strategic plan, which is private sector collaboration. And so that could very um, easily fit into um, connect, make that connection with uh, the conversations that are happening. And then on the HOA piece, um, and as Lucas mentioned, the city zoning that um, kind of ties into that, that would be um, the strategic plan goal seven of quality and environments. Um, so just kind of to connect those two things. So Lucas, I don't know if you're back yet. I am, yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. I was going to um, some thoughts that I had, um, and we can talk about that in next steps here in a few minutes. I know Emily had a comment that she wanted to make about the child care mapping experience. Um, not sure if, you know, we're at a place where we want to say that we've identified a couple of areas where we want to focus on. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Um, I, I, I don't have specific, anything specific yet. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing what Emily has to say. Well, so some, I mean, I did very many people in the group go through the, the data, the report that came back. Um, I, first of all, I, I felt very validated I, because like I was, listening to comments that were <laughs> reflective of me. Um, one of the things that um, I had seen, you know, I was very proud that like, you know, when you looked at like the type of facility that answered, um, you know, the majority of responses came from, you know, like licensed and, and group daycare. So, you know, very clearly we're getting our voice out there. Um, uh, but like, so we had, like 300 to almost 400 respondents, but 40, no, like 80% of those people were um, like white. I'm trying to find all that. And what it makes me, what that raises for me is that there is an equitability issue here in the conversations that, you know, I've been saying, you know, we've got to get people to the table, got to get people to the table. But for me, what jumped out strikingly, you know, the ethnicity was the 80 85.2% identified as white. I know that that is not reflective of the workforce. Um, and so, so it also, if we're going to look at quality and environments, it, it also raises for me, how do we get the conversation out there so that who we are speaking to and about is reflective, that we have representation that represents who is doing this work, uh, because I know that people are there, um, but in the data, it it doesn't. It, I I think that we have some some gaps that we need to attend to in this data, and, and I'm not saying this to criticize anything. I'm saying like this told me, hey, this is a direction we need to start focusing on, and so I just kind of wanted to open up a conversation on what any like what anybody else interpreted from the report.
Or um, another question might be for anyone that might have an answer is, are there other data sets out there that do have a, a better representation of, of what Emily's talking about? This is Jenny, um, Jenny Welch Buller. And uh, it's been a while since I looked at the results. So I have to admit, I, need, I do need, I missed the last meeting and I need to refresh myself. Um, but I do think overall uh, in terms of, um, I guess speaking from amongst a group of people who who focus a lot on surveys and data, that um, it is a it is a shortcoming that we recognize, and that I do think that there are some positive things going on at the state level when it comes to thinking about um, different creative ways to market these opportunities to share perspectives and to, and different um, like messaging is really important, right? And how and finding out what are the avenues of communication that. Uh, that people trust, what are trusted sources, um, trusted ways of sharing information, is sharing, how can um, we ensure people that their data, which includes opinions, thoughts, all of that is safe. Um, and I do think we have a long ways to go, but I agree. Um, one of the things that I know from a research perspective that we struggle with is just having actual data on the workforce um, to actually be able to say, okay, X number, individuals are in this type of staffing role and have these demographics. And so I think though, um, I, again, work in progress that perhaps with the workforce registry, we'll be able to get a little bit closer um, to having um, data that helps us say, are we doing enough? Are we working hard enough, creatively enough to ensure that all folks who um, are interested in sharing information and giving feedback um, are? Um, so hopeful there, again, messaging, marketing, how we talk about those things will be so important to making sure people trust and feel safe sharing that data. I see Jennifer, my other, the other Jenny in the room, Jennifer. Jennifer, I'm glad to see you raise your hand because I was getting ready to ask you if you had some information on that to share. Well, I, I, I want to agree with what everybody has said. I think it is, um, exceedingly difficult to uh, figure out ways to be able to um, get representative information from in just in general I'll just say um, you know trying to collect data um, around that I think that both uh, you Jenny and um, Emily have hit on some really important points and really trying to figure out ways that are going to um, increase opportunities for people to, like Jenny, you were saying, to feel comfortable and safe in providing that information. Um, I know that with, uh, and, and I can really only speak to, you know, the, the things that I've been involved with recently and um, talk a little bit about one of the ways that we are going to be approaching trying to collect some additional data on the from the needs assessment survey is um, trying to engage um, local community folks uh, in helping us with that um, through a variety of different methods so um, many of you probably are aware Kansas is the land grant university here in Kansas and so we have um, extension, um, which is uh, located in all of our counties across the state of Kansas. And oftentimes those folks are um, living in those communities, connected with those uh, people in those communities. And so we have um, explored um, trying to use that system um, to help us uh, gather additional data. But I think that one of the things, and, and we've been having these conversations uh, with the groups that I've been involved with about um, how do we also use facilitators that are that look like the people in those communities that speak the language that those people speak in those communities, and so um, so I do know that there are efforts, uh, as Jenny said, you know, across the state that are really trying to address those, and and I would be very very interested in hearing from all of you about your thoughts on on that because it is something that um, we struggle with or i should say i should i shouldn't use that word that kind of royal we it, i'll just say i struggle with and so um uh, yeah i i would really appreciate feedback on that as well 
Well, and I, Sheila, I saw that your hand was up. I have a thought, but I don't want to skip if you have something that needs to be said. Well, um, I just kind of wanted to touch base, you know, so every um, program most likely in a community has community surveys every year. Is there a question that we can pose or create to send out to communities to um, add on to their surveys so that that's a component of data that we can collect back? That's just a thought. So my thinking, you know, like data are neither good nor bad. Data, data are data. <laughs> it's simply the answers to questions that are asked. And when, you know, my, my thought goes into when we have a situation where data have now presented seemingly a gap, then that now, that actually acts as the, the answer of, hey, we have a few more questions that we need to start asking and maybe we need to about face. Because um, like I, I look at this mapping as like, this was getting going. We have, you know, if you look at almost 400 responses, well, that is almost 10% of the workforce. It's less than 10%, but getting there, almost 10% of the workforce. That is actually a good start to an, an effort. And, and so, um, so I, I think that's part of it also is looking at, we're not really attaching goodness and badness to the data, but we are gonna use them to, to help us understand like where we need to focus and what does that do for the quality of the environments? Because if we're not getting the voice of different cultures, different ethnicities, different communities, it, if we're not getting that voice, then we can't actually say that we are truly improving quality. Um, and so I, I, that, that's one of my pieces of feedback there. Okay, I greatly appreciate the conversation today. It's always very inspiring to hear everybody's comments. And we have five minutes before the rest of the um, groups are gonna be joining back in. So in, in taking some notes about what are next steps and, and kind of addressing all of the uh, topic areas that have been uh, brought up today, I'm wondering um, if Jenny, you would be willing to um, share some information with us either next month during our meeting time or things that I can send out um, in my follow-up email about that true cost of care and the workforce compensation information. Um, and, you know, everyone, please chime in if you have other ideas or, you know, what your preferences are on, on what you want this to look like. And then also you just mentioned, you know, um, efforts that are happening to kind of address some of these data gaps and, and, you know, what should that look like? How can we share that information back out with everybody and address that uh, moving forward? So I'll let you think on that. And then if you want to reach out to me and, you know, kind of we can see what that looks like next steps. Um, a couple of other uh, thoughts that I had were on the um, on the story sharing. Um, you know, do Lucas or Jeremy or anyone else have some talking points that they would like to bring back and share out with us uh, next month? On you know, as we're out working in communities, trying to promote this education for for business people and such, you know, what what might those talking points look like? And so if you either of you have thoughts around that, or other people have things that they would like to learn or hear, um, you know, that was something that was on my list. Lucas? Yeah, I, I wanted to um, add that, you know, in addition to talking points, if, if, if there's an opportunity for Jeremy to walk through Hilltop's budget and how that creates their tuition scale, um, I, I think they have, uh, they do it right. Um, you know, they, they account for the true cost of care, adequately paying employees, uh, and, and then how that gets turned into tuition rates. So I, I'd love, uh, love to have uh, Jeremy present if, if that's appropriate. And if he's willing to do that. Um. Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to share kind of our process. Um, if that would people find that useful.
And this, I mean, this is this is Jenny again. Um, this is kind of exciting because actually, if we have that, we can take those elements and plug them into the Simon Workman model that we were talking about. We have a draft and then say, what if we apply this across the state? What would that mean? Um, we, we need to plug in some fam family child care data numbers too to experiment. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to also just continue to tie it back to quality, but I think if we're talking about what is using that as an example of what we think quality compensation would be, we can then look at the cost of the system and then maybe that can lead to other conversations. I wanna be mindful of what other work groups are doing. Um, so Debbie, I might look to you to for a little guidance on making sure I don't mix stream, cross the streams. <laughs> so. Well, and I'll coordinate with Sarah for what their group is doing, and we might hear that in the report out, you know, or that's a question that we can ask them during the report out if we want to, you know, and how, how can we collaborate on that. Um, the other yes. thought that I had, uh, Lucas mentioned, you know, maybe it would be easier to address the issue of local zoning rather than HOA, um, as you know, the barriers that prevent uh, home child cares from starting. So I don't know, Lucas, if you have any information um, on that particular topic that you think would be useful for the group. Um, I, I can think about that. I, um, I, I think I think my question is more, are, would we wanna make a recommendation to change that uh, as a goal? Because if we go after HOAs, I, I assume that that would mean going to the legislature uh, and, and in some some form and saying, hey, we want we want to change what HOAs can regulate. And you immediately have some very strong uh, interest groups who would be against us. And we don't want the realtors and the home builders to be against us. Um, so what about the zoning regulations? I mean, if we were to develop at some point a recommendation about zoning, is there something that could be more universal with the zoning regulation pertaining to child care so that it's not so different in every community? Is that, is that a doable? Um, yeah, we could, we could definitely look at like model language or, or even just, you know, something that we could share out with uh, city leadership on why, why this matters. And, and, you know, there would be an opportunity to get in front of city leaders that there's a, you know, there'd be a different, a couple different opportunities throughout a year to say your zoning may be part of why you have a childcare problem. Hey, Lucas, is there, instead of getting in front of the legislature and asking for, you know, mandated legislation, is there a way of looking at it in forms of like, tax deductions, rebates, things like that, that could be applied to the HOA, that like the HOA would ha somehow have some sort of tax incentive, things like that. I, and I, I legitimately don't know. I, I assume that HOAs don't have a big tax burden because if, if they did, I don't know how they would exist. Yeah, and, the, and that's true. <laughs> Okay, well, our time is up and everybody's joined back in. So I will be getting some follow-up information out to the quality and environments group. So thank you everyone. And I'm turning it back over to Amanda. Terrific. Hi everybody, this is Amanda Peterson. I hate to jump in on really great conversation and it always feels like just when, um, just when you're kind of getting to the heart of something, right? That it's time to stop and come back together. Um, so thanks everybody for your time in work groups. We'll now spend time reporting out. And I know that I'm definitely listening with my ear for, uh, gosh, where do I have opportunities to, to make connections to work that I might be doing or what ideas does this spark for uh, work that we have going on here at, uh, here at our agency or what might we be able to do in the future. So I hope that all of you are as well. And I'll pause for a minute. I didn't check to make sure that we were all back in the big room first. So I'll pause for just a minute to make sure that all of our folks can back on. There we go. I think that we will, or we will go ahead now and report out and I'll ask the child care recruitment and retention group to report out first. 
This is Sarah Gardner. I'm the facilitator of the Child Care Recruitment Retention Work Group. We um, spent the conversation talking about wages and compensation for child care professionals um, as it relates to, you know, continuing to recruit and, of course, um, being a, one of the biggest factors in retaining child care professionals in the field. Um, we touched on a couple of different variables to consider with this. Um, one of them being um, looking at the pay parity and what would a wage scale look like that notes pay parity with K-12 educators. Um, the desire for a calculator or some kind of tool to help um, center directors, family child care providers understand what that looks like. Um, so to equip providers and owners and leaders to have that information. Then we talked a lot about um, the need for understanding the cost of quality care um, and that being a driver of wages and compensation as well. We talked about who is defining that cost of quality care, what other states might be doing this work. Um, we talked about the need to um, use, it, it, should we explore a wages compensation scale to think about how subsidy folds into that? Um, we know we have a low uptake on um, subsidy uh, enrollment by families as well as providers. And we know DCF is exploring the family side of that to try and uncover some of those reasons. So we're interested in seeing the results of that. Um, and the final thing I'll note is the there is a, a sort of a national consultant, Simon Workman, who has been developing models, cost of care models um, around prenatal to five um, services and specifically childcare and that we um, will have him come and talk to our work group at the panel meeting in May, or we've invited him to come talk to our work group at the panel meeting in May about what those uh, cost of quality care calculators look like, what they could do, how you populate them, how you and what, what informs them. Because um, one of our biggest questions is who decides what the cost of quality is and what factors go into that. So um, we had a really good discussion though. So others in the working group, please chime in. Um, chime this in. is Amy Gottschammer. I would just add that in, with relationship to the, um, to the calculator we discussed that, that we were hoping that it not only would sort of uh, generate uh, a salary schedule that that somebody could utilize that would would say you know not only that if you have a bachelor's degree you should make the same thing as somebody that's a kindergarten teacher with a bachelor's degree but that it would work backwards towards um, somebody that that maybe has an associate's degree or a CDA or some other credential so that's it, it's working backwards as well as forwards and that it also would um, accommodate the those it, you know off hours maybe people that work uh, niche jobs or the specialty positions or do um, like night night care or, or weekend care or something like that and and um, maybe even a, a account for people that work full or part-time but to an even bigger point that that this thing could maybe be printed out so that you have something you can take and show to advocate for why you should be able to pay for this you could take it to a local business leader or you know somebody in your community and say look these are the kind of wages that i need to be paying but i'm paying about 60 percent of this because i can't afford to pay what i should be paying so that this tool is not only useful in terms of you know trying to create you know whatever you're going to be paying your, your own staff but to to, to explain it to the rest of the community, whether it's your, your legislative leaders or, or your, your business leaders. So um, that kind of a tool as well. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Amy. Do we have any questions, panel members? All right, then next up is our family navigation work group. <clears throat> Hi, this is Gail Kozad, and I am reporting out for our Family Navigation Work Group. Um, <clears throat> we had a couple of presentations from um, several people, uh, one around Family Resource Centers and the National Family Support Network and standards, and um, had a presentation about that, as well as 1-800-CHILDREN, and then Help Me Grow, and how Help Me Grow is um, uh, working with very closely with 1-800-CHILDREN um, um, and so we had some good conversation about or some excitement about some of the things that they're working on around uh, ASQs and trying to integrate that into 1-800-CHILDREN. 1-800-CHILDREN. 
we had further discussion really. <clears throat> so those were some of the, re the reports that we received from our guests. Um, but really our discussion uh, tended to focus primarily around 1-800-CHILDREN. Lots of excitement about um, how that can continue to be utilized, um, how it can continue to get out into the communities, how it, how it can be an access point. And so a lot of discussion about um, how either the early, how we can either incorporate into um, funding requirements, um, not just that programs enter their information into the database, but also a requirement for sharing that information with parents. Um, and then a lot of discussion about different ways to share the information with both partners um, and programs across the state, as well as parents. And so it was really good conversation. Um, I, it, it was actually a lot of fun. We got pretty energized focusing around that. <laughs> I don't, um, so it was, it, we talked a lot about one particular thing. Um, and so it's not a huge report out, but um, we're going to regroup on that and see if that turns into some sort of recommendation. Uh, so anyway, um, I don't know if Crystal or anybody else from the group would like to chime in. If I did a okay job capturing that. You did great. <laughs> Terrific. Well, thank you, Gail. I'm really excited about that as, as well. So we'll stay tuned on that front. Any, uh, any questions or discussion for the group? All right, then quality and environments. Hi, Lucas Neese here. Um, we talked a lot about capacity and um, both from you know, how do we how do we move a conversation forward on making investments for new centers? Uh, also, zoning, uh, HOA. What does that conversation look like? What kind of recommendations might our group make on that? We spent a lot of our time uh, kind of wishing that we were in the recruitment and retention group, um, and uh, I think. That conversation will actually continue for us. We're, and we're very excited to hear what, what you all uh, have, have to share with us. But um, and another piece would be that um, as, we, as we gather data, uh, wanting to make sure that it uh, reflects the diversity of our workforce and diversity of our families. And um, um, And there was one last thing that, that came that I wanted to share with everybody that has uh, has gone. So um, uh, maybe somebody else will, will, will be able to share that. Recruitment and retention group members, anything to add? Lucas, it might have been uh, the conversation around the storytelling of the success stories uh, from both your program in Lindsberg that you're um, in charge of, and then the one in uh, Lawrence Hilltop with Jeremy and how we might be able to bring some of those stories and uh, success plans back to the group to uh, be able to share out as talking points and uh, a learning, learning process. I think that was part of it, yeah. Thank you, Debbie, for, for raising that, yeah. Well, and this is Emily Barnes. Um, I, I think part of also with the um, recruitment and retention, we were kind of identifying like a little bit of overlap in that, you know, some of what um, spurs quality is, you know, funding, you know, the, the concept of sustainable funding that, um, you know, part of the way we are able to make things happen is with money and but that money has to be able to be sustained long term and it can't just be determined as you know one time stop gap type stuff and so that that's kind of where we were identifying a little bit of overlap there um and so kind of you know being able to to glean from the recruitment and retention some of you know what's coming out of there then could also influence where the conversation goes in quality and environments and I just remembered, thank you, Emily. I just remembered what it was, and I do want to make a point of saying it. We talked about the importance of whether it's being being a voice at Chamber of Commerce, uh, other places where childcare is not well represented, uh, where there are people who who depend on the services that that we provide. Um, 
figuring out how to make our voices heard. And, and we acknowledge that there's lots of obstacles. There's a time obstacle, there's a cost obstacle, but I want to encourage everybody um, to, to, you know, maybe on an annual basis, find an opportunity to get in front of some of these other folks who don't think about childcare, uh, who de depend on the work that we're doing. Thanks, Lucas. And Jenny, I saw that you had had your hand up. Oh, right. Thank you. It was a little impromptu hand up just to add on, and I, but I think Lucas covered it. Um, also, just maybe being able to add in our group what um, we have some folks who might be able to talk about what the cost of quality looks like and that we could then maybe contribute to the other work group in terms of plugging in and seeing then if we were to apply that um, model, how what would it cost to do that? by the so these are some of the things that we the crossover points thank you terrific jenny and i see nods and thumbs up and, and hand claps from from the folks here on the screen i'll say i do it sounds like you all had terrific conversation and it's so great to hear the energy coming back i'll also share i um you know lucas i might steal the facilitation technique of forgetting one thing in a report out and having everybody chime in so if you all find yourself in a group with me in the future uh, beware before you select me as the person to report out because i really liked that um even though it, it may not have been intentional but um terrific okay everybody well that brings us to um to the final part of today's meeting um do we have any requests for future agenda items you can either share those now or uh, you can also anytime during the month feel welcome to reach out to debbie to request what might be ahead lucas i see you're off mute i i don't have an agenda item i have an invitation when that's appropriate that might be appropriate during the bright spot section yeah but thank you we'll be ready any other requests all right, then Lucas, would you like to share your invitation? Yeah, so uh, our construction is nearing an end. And so uh, we will have an open house May 22nd to Sunday from three to six, uh, coffee and cookies because it's Lindsborg and you, uh, little Sweden can't do anything without coffee. So um, uh, go to childcareforlindsborg.org if you want more information or reach out to me. but. Sunday, May 22nd from three to six, big open house. We're very proud of the facility that we've built and uh, excited to share it with folks. Terrific, thank you, Lucas. Oh, was somebody chiming in there? Well, I know that um, I'm not the only person who misses seeing people in 3D. So thanks as always for uh, opportunities for, for folks to connect. Um, and I hope it's a really terrific event in, uh, on May 22nd. Any other bright spots to share with the group today? Maritas, go ahead. Yes, we we thank you. We thank the community and the people on the panel who were able to make it to our open house last week. It was fun. So thank you. I'm looking forward. I wish Lucas, I have to look at my calendar if I can drive all the way to Lindsberg on my 22nd. Terrific. Thank you, Maritas. Yes, I saw the, uh, the pictures on the State School for the Blinds Facebook page and it looked like it was a terrific event. Cornelia, go ahead. So, um, so you, you may know already that we have a scholarship program for our parents where any parent of a child who was enrolled in top receives a scholarship to go to um, either Butler Community College and receive an associate degree or a technical degree. And uh, we started that um, several years ago after I, um, my college education helped me get out of poverty and where I am. And so I wanted to be able to kind of do something for families to be able to help with that. We have had 43 parents graduate. Um, and so I was so excited when I got that number yesterday. And, uh, and so these are 43 people who are now like living their dreams and like taking better care of their families and um, now uh, working their way out of poverty. And so I just wanted to share that news. Thanks so much for sharing that, Cornelia. Congratulations to them. That's terrific. Yeah. Emily, go ahead. Here we go. Um, I wanted to say that um, on the 20th, on April 23rd, CCPC will begin our conference. Um, it will last from the 23rd through the 28th um, with big event, 
on a virtual event on Saturday, lasting all day, and then Monday through Thursday, um, one training session per night um, for everybody. We Our goal for enrollment was 150 participants, and we have hit 170. So um, this is clearly a model that um, providers are engaging with. And so we're very, very proud of that. And of course, you know, we get to, you know, give out some awards to, to people and, and everything. So, um, so I'm excited for that. But I also wanted to give um, a pat on the back to this group as a result of many of the conversations we've been able to schedule multiple uh, town halls and webinars and things in the evenings coming up within the next few weeks. And so um, it, it's really refreshing to see the, the product that, you know, the, the conversations have led to action and actual real tangible results where people are um, getting information and able to engage. And so I just want to thank everybody here that not are we, not only are we talking about it, but we're making it happen. So thank you. Go team. Thank you, Emily, for sharing that. Megan, go ahead. I, I know I'm not a, like officially a panel member, but I thought I would take an opportunity while I had it. And to piggyback a little bit off of Emily, um, next Thursday, we are going to be hosting in partnership with CCPC, um, a pandemic relief town hall. Um, next Thursday evening at 630 registration link will be going out today. So check your social media um, and emails and things like that. Uh, we're really excited about it. We're really hoping to take the opportunity to give some updates, but most importantly, answer questions. So in that registration link, there will be an opportunity to submit questions that you hope to have answered. And then we will also have opportunity during that to do some, um, some live uh, question and answer opportunities as well to just answer all the questions that people have um, about the pandemic relief spending. Awesome. What a wonderful opportunity for all of us to help spread the word about that. Thanks, Megan. And Amy, go ahead. Thanks. So um, I was just going to share that our Lawrence Kindergarten Transitions team um, was actually last Saturday going to have a early childhood early childhood family resource fair um, and then KU won and it was a whole thing. And then they were going to have their big parade on Saturday. So we ended up changing it to April 30th and then they changed theirs to Sunday, but be that as it may, <laughs> we're now having it on April 30th, but our resource fair is going to be at our new um, early childhood um, community center. So it's been going to be kind of a community introduction to that building. We're going to have um, more than 40 tabling uh, or organizations tabling at the event, all outdoors. Um, we're going to have the playground available for the kids. We're going to have um, a food truck there. We're going to have public health is going to be bringing um, their mobile vaccination unit so they can do um the COVID vaccines for kiddos. Um, we're also going to have our Lawrence Public uh, Bookmobile is going to be there from the library. Um, we're going to have live music, children's music playing from a couple of musicians in town. And then all of the, re the, the resource part of the resource for the, the people that are providing the, um, that'll be tabling are every kind of resource that a child or a family with young children might need to make sure their child is successful when they trans uh, transition into kindergarten. So we've got early childhood providers, but then we've got, whether it's pediatric, uh, you know, speech therapists or pediatric ophthalmologists or um, play therapists, whatever, um, all of them are there. Plus there's going to be people from Tiny K and parents as teachers and the school district and somebody is going to be teaching parents how to fill out their ASQs. And we've got all kinds of stuff going on at this event. So it's going to be amazing. And we're so excited. And we've got a photographer coming just to do just gratis um, uh, photos for families with their kids and We've got a little mini golf thing that's going to be there for the kids to play with. And uh, we've got community volunteers helping to set up tables and organize things. So we're really excited. We're hoping it's going to be a yearly event for us. And um, yeah, April 30th. And we're very excited. So wish us luck. That is so wonderful. Good luck, Amy. And for everybody, I'll just say, uh, you know, it's always a, a beautiful day to be a Saturday morning in Lawrence, Kansas. So uh, rock track. Any other, any other bright spots to share with the group? All right. Well, thank you everybody for sharing. It's wonderful to be with you all. I feel incredibly energized and I hope that all of you enjoy a terrific and peaceful weekend ahead. Um, here you can see listed our upcoming meetings. They'll be held 
um, the early childhood recommendations panel meeting will be held virtually, um, and you, the, uh, you can also see here the Children's Cabinet and Trust Fund meeting on Friday, June 3rd, um, and the early childhood stakeholders group meeting that afternoon. Enjoy a wonderful rest of your Friday. Enjoy a really peaceful, uh, peaceful and wonderful weekend, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all soon. Take care, everybody. All right, good team. Trying to stop.